Thank God. Well, tonight we are going to talk a little bit about life and how I'm starting to see it through older eyes, and it looks a little different than when you're younger. And we're backstage tonight at the Atlantic City Hilton. And uh, hey, if you were a fan of blue collar comedy, my guest tonight was responsible for 25% of this. 25%. Incident. Bill Engelbaugh. Welcome Good to Atlantic City. Dave. So, um, all right, blue collar is in the past and now in the future and in the present is the Bill Engvall show on TBS now season number three. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, it's uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to say it's a lifelong dream. I mean, uh, I can remember working at the Comedy Corner in Dallas, Texas, back in 1980, and uh, I was emceeing the show for Eddie Murphy and Joe Piscopo, who were oh. still on <laughs> SNL at that time, and uh, the local. Uh, Hollywood, you know, the local entertainment reporter mm -hmm. threw me a bone and, and, and put me in an interview because, you know, she was there interviewing them and she wanted me. And she said, what do you want out of all this? And I said, you know, I, someday I'd like to have my own family sitcom, a clean family sitcom that everybody could watch. And this was back mm -hmm. in 1980. She wrote almost 30 years ago. Yeah, the, 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 still the, got, the, inter still got the article that she wrote. Wow. Bobby Wygant was her name. Wow. And so it, it took 25 plus years, but it happened for you. It did, uh, and I think uh, there's a reason. It's because I think God knew that I couldn't handle this in my 20s. You know, I think there was a reason. I think he just went, uh, let's wait a little while. Uh, and But you know what's nice, Dave, and I'll tell you is that I've been married for 25 years to the same woman, and uh, she was there when we were, a big night was us putting chicken in top ramen noodles, you know, and now, <laughs> when we're able to have a nicer life. And she's, it's nice to be able to enjoy that with someone who's been through it with you. So you uh, can still go back and have that top Oh, with, with and I do, I but, do. But, but you can also go out and, and, and have a little dinner party with Reba McIntyre. That's right. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we were talking about that Yeah, a, a that was Yeah, uh, that was still one of those weird moments. Uh, we went, had dinner with uh, Reba called me, and because uh, well, I had toured with her. And, right. we, and I, I'm one of those people that, you know, once I meet you, you know, if you're a good Joe and you're hanging out, you know, I'll stay friends with you forever. You know, I'll call you in the middle of the night. What are you doing? You know, and so Reba and I stayed in touch. And uh, so she called one night and said, uh, why don't you and Gail come over for dinner? And I said, all right. She was it's going to be me and Narvel and you and Gail and John Tesh and Connie Selica and Mac Davis and his wife. And I hung, up the, dinner yeah, I hung up the phone and I told my wife and she goes, Ugh. It's just weird, you know, that, <laughs> but, you know, we go, and they're just people like we were. It's not name dropping because you no. know the people that you know. They're just people, people you, yeah, it's, it's just, a, you, it's like you're, it, you went from, I still have my, like, I have my friends that I, my best friends from college that I go to the ranch with and we sit there and, and they're people that you wouldn't know from that, you know, one's an accountant, one sells real estate, you know, and then I have this other group of friends that you go, wow, that's your friend? <laughs> Josh well, Beckett's your friend? Those are pinch me yeah, moments. Yeah. Aren't, aren't, I mean, those are pinch yeah, me moments. Yeah, when Josh Beckett you. calls you and says, hey, are you cool with tickets for the playoffs? I go, yeah, I got them, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. It is amazing. And it's a blast. And it's what I've always, it's, this career has been everything I, I dreamt it would be. I mean, here I am sitting at the Atlantic City Hilton. There's people that are paid money to hear what I have to talk about. My name's Up in Lights. I'm riding on a million dollar tour bus. That's not mine, I just lease it. But but then tomorrow I'll go home and I'll go down to the beach with my son and I'll watch him surf. And so it's like, we got this great balance. Yeah, of, so you of, get the of, best of both yeah, worlds. Then, you yeah, know? Wow. So this started out for you in, in Texas. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a Texas boy. Uh, you were a DJ, weren't, weren't you? Uh, well, or, or, I, mean, or, or, I wasn't a legitimate DJ. Uh, right. My DJing involved the term, gentlemen, get out your wallets, here comes Cheyenne. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It wasn't like, yeah, yeah. Right. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, then I did, uh, I, I mainly worked, uh, what I would do is I would work like from happy hour till 10, spinning records. And, and then I did move over to a dance club because uh, <laughs> it just was weird. <laughs> uh, I had enough ACDC and... Metallica for all my life during those three years and uh, then they opened up a comedy club and a buddy of mine and I went there on the amateur night just to watch mm -hmm. uh, and it was, had you ever thought about you know you know up there? I, yes I had uh, uh, to be honest say you know hey Bill you're funny you gotta get well, you know, what happened was I, I listened to Steve Martin's Let's Get Small album when I was in college yeah. one of the greats but and uh, 
I did a show for my frat brothers. That was it at the school. But that, but I you know it was like uh, you know I was always kind of the funny guy. And uh, we got to this comedy club and it was sold out. And my friend, because I didn't have twenty bucks, <laughs> he gave the doorman twenty bucks, and the doorman went and moved two people, and we sat down. And turns out that my man, the, my boss from the dance club, was there that night because this new club had just opened, this comedy club, and he was meeting the, you know, all the club owners meeting. So we're sitting there having a couple of beers, and he comes over. He goes, "Are you going up?" And I go, "No." I go, "I'm just here to watch." Yeah, a couple more beers, a little liquid encouragement goes up, and he comes over with the woman. He goes, "Go up, do that, do some of that stuff you do in between songs." I didn't have an act. I just went up and talked about Dallas and local stuff, and people laughed. And uh, the that's woman, an intoxicating thing. Isn't oh, it? When, when people you have no thing. idea. Yeah, it is the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, people. I know people have a fear of. Uh, they say a fear of speaking in public. I actually have a fear of speaking in public, but if I can be funny, you know, like if so, if you just said, like if somebody came to me and said. We want you to do uh, just talk about this. Mm -hmm. There's a little no jokes. No jokes. Yeah, no just, jokes. There's a little trepidation. Like, oh, uh, you know, but if I can be me and just be funny, then it then it doesn't bother me at all. But oh, there's no better drug in the world than when the you got the crowd and they're with you and it's like that's why I laugh during my show and people always say, "Are you laughing at your own stuff?" And I it, go, it's the best drug in the world, uh, and you can get addicted to it and not have to go through rehab. It's the best. There's no 12 really? steps. It's <laughs> right. There's just one step. You know, yeah, it's, I love the, it. it's the best. I love stand-up. Living with me is no picnic because I'm a comedian. I'm wired different. I think about things different, and that's where I get my material. And I'll give you a great example. The other night, we're lying in bed, all right? Now, just picture it's a dark room, and we're, my wife and I are just lying in bed. And in the darkness, I said this. I have a question for you. And she goes, okay. And I said, if I was in a horrible crash and both my arms were cut off, would you pick my nose? <laughs> it's a legitimate question. And the bed light came on. <laughs> and she goes, what did you just say? And I said, if I was in a horrible crash and both my arms were ripped off, would you pick my nose? And she turned off the light and said, no. And I said, then you don't love me. And she goes, I do love you, but I'm not gonna pick your nose. And I said, but what if I had a big old booger that was wedged up in there and it was impeding the way I breathed and I might die. And she was, and we would go to the drugstore and I'd get one of those baby suckers and I'd suck it out of your nose, but I am not gonna pick your nose. And in the darkness, I lay there and went, well, I'd pick your nose. I'm sitting on top of the world right now. And, uh, it's, uh, and, and the thing that's great, and it was about Blue Collar and, and the Bill Engvall show, is that it has allowed me now, when that time comes for me to step aside, I can step aside and go, I did everything I wanted to do. You see that day coming anytime soon? No. no. I, I uh, you know, I take that back. Uh, I can see cutting back mm -hmm. a lot because I still hit it pretty hard, like when the show's not in production. Right. Um, but well, I how can, much are you out on the road? And when, um, when you're I mean, it's you know, it, it's not like it was when I was in the club days, but right. it, you know, it's pretty much every weekend that I'm, you know, like this is the end of a five-day run, uh, and uh, so it's it's Friday, Saturday, uh, but I can see taking the cherry gigs like this, you know, like right. yeah, but. I, I, I like I, when I read, talked to Bob Newhart the other day. Uh, I, he still does. It. You know, he right. goes, he goes. You can't ever stop doing it. He yeah, said, I think he's going to do like thirty shows this yeah, year. Yeah, and just I can enough. see me doing that. Doing like right. here at Liz, we're going to pick twenty to thirty dates, and that's it. You know, and, and we'll do them. Uh, and you figure twelve months. You're doing two a month, maybe yeah. three a month. Uh, the acting thing is still new enough to me that I really still love that. Now, if the show, if I could get this show to go for another two or three years, then I could be done with that. Then that goes into syndication. Yeah, and so then I get to the show to syndication, uh, that's great. Mm -hmm. But uh, my thing that I really want is, I wanna be, a, my wife and I have just finished, you know, we're just about to be empty nesters. And uh, we have together set up the greatest life for us, you know, uh, post kids. Right. And I wanna be young enough still to enjoy that and do the things and ski and play golf and Go fly fishing. I've been married for over half my life. <laughs> I don't even remember it. I know I was born, and then I was at an altar. It's, 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 and I, before we get into all this, let me state this, that I do love my wife. I mean, 25 years, I, I love her to death. 
But here's what's weird is that now our kids are grown. And so my wife and I are spending more time together. And it's not that we really want to. <laughs> it's just we can't find two other people who want to talk about our kids that much. <laughs> and it's just this weird new existence. It's like, see, we go on walks. Let's go on a walk. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but we go on walks, and it's her telling me about her day. And me eventually stopping and saying, I cannot walk any slower, please pick it up. She's put off a lot for me to do what I have to do. And so I, now it's my turn to say, all right, and I don't want to be one of the guy that works dead forever. So what I, you know, but also now, you do somebody a 20, 30 dates a year, then she can come with you. You know, she can come with me. She can go, you know, I'm going to Atlanta and say, all right, let's go. Cool. You mentioned Newhart. He was a big influence on you years oh, ago, wasn't he? Huge. I mean, my dad had all his albums, the, all the button down mine uh, albums, and I'd listen to them. And the one sided phone calls were just genius. They I still mean, are. Oh, I mean, I, very few people can I do that. I can tell you that my dream show right now is uh, on the TBS show, I play a family therapist. And I'm actually right now working on getting Bob to do a two episode <laughs> show <laughs> arc. Where he comes in and and at some point during that thing he will he'll like like I'll be in with a patient, yep. and then we'll cut to him sitting in the thing and the phone will ring and he'll pick up and he'll do a one-sided phone call is and he, I would just be, I would be sitting is right he underneath. The, is he receptive to it? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just he we're waiting for the right time and I tell you if that happens I would be sitting underneath that lead camera just, <laughs> you know, because he's the king. Because and and it, it's still a thrill for you. I mean, when, work, especially working with someone like a Bob Newhart, mm -hmm. who's a genius. I, I, wow. I, I think he's a genius. I loved his book. Uh, uh, you know, the two, two of my favorite books came out this year. Was Steve Martin's book, uh, which, you know, it proved to me that Steve Martin and Bob Newhart's book, neither one was more than about that thing. Right. You, know, you see these people write these autobiographies that are this yeah. big. It's like, you know, they got, they told you everything you need to know. Yeah, in, right. In, in that much. In a one-day read. Right. You know. Well, that was like um, the other book that comes to mind that, that was thin but so full of, of good stuff was Rickles' book, which mm -hmm. is the name of the book, is, is Rickles' book. And I read it one day on a flight from Spokane to Minneapolis, and it was a, a good read. It was full of information. Yeah. You know, Everything you want to know. It was yes. Right. I love, yeah. Bob, my favorite line about uh, Bob Newhart's, in Bob Newhart's book is he said, in the very first chapter, he's talking about what he was going to call the book. And he said he wanted to call it How to Lose 10 Pounds Overnight. <laughs> and it said the editor said, you can't because there's no weight loss tips in here. And he goes, but if they'd let me, this thing would have been through the roof already. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. The, the title alone would, yeah, would, would yeah. grab people. All right. Let's, let's, I mentioned blue collar at the top of the show. So let's talk about that because mm -hmm. I would think it was blue collar that helped you get the Bill Engvall show. Oh, well, definitely. Uh, blue collar, uh, op you know, Here's Your Sign had come out and I was doing well with that. Blue Collar came out, and that just it opened the door. You know, Larry and Ron probably got the most out of it. Really? Uh, you think? Yeah. Uh, 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 what do you say? Because Larry was literally, no, nobody yeah, knew anybody. Right, now exactly. he's doing 9,000 yeah, people right. a night. And same right. with Ron. Yeah. Uh, and I already, Jeff was already way up there, and that's probably them. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's my wife. <laughs> this will be funny. I can. Right. So, yeah. Welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, I'm doing a TV interview. Can I call you right back? Love Hi, you. Gail. <laughs> <laughs> you love it. God loves cell Actually, you, you ready for this? That happened to us once, and, and Jake, you remember this, when we were shooting John Tesh about 10 years ago at Caesars. Connie called him. Oh, yeah. In the middle, in the middle and he's like, oh, okay. So, yeah, you got to take you it. Gotta, it's, if it's you a wife, yeah. you, you got to take yeah, it. But, right. but Blue Collar was... Uh, <laughs> was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, because I already had a little bit of a name, what it did right. was it just kind of expounded on that. And I, I think I told you earlier in the newspaper interview that a blue collar, I always said, was like being married to a rich girl. Yes. It was yeah. a blast mm -hmm. and was great. But after a while, you want to show people you can earn your own living. And that's why when we talked about the Bill Ingvall show, that, that night before the pilot aired, I was on pins and needles because it had to work mm -hmm. because it was my first project without the guys. Right. And, you know, they had their stuff. Larry had health inspector and Jeff was doing fifth grader and, you and know, Ron I, was drunk. Ron was somewhere, <laughs> Ron we don't know where. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, and, but it was really, it was really important to me because I was the guy, it, we used to joke about it. It was Jeff, Ron, Larry, and what's that other guy's name? 
Because I was the least character. You know, Jeff was the redneck right. guy, and Larry was the caricature of, of a redneck guy. And Ron was the Dean Martin boozing kind of. And I really was just kind of there. You know, I didn't have that definitive. This kind of reminds me of the episode, the Seinfeld episode, where they, they were talking about the three tenors, and everybody knew Pavarotti, right, and right. everybody knew, knew um, uh, 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 Dominguez. Mm -hmm. They couldn't remember Carreras. Right. You know, he was like, who's the other guy? That other guy, yeah. yeah. And that's what, in fact, we used to joke about that. There was like, you know, that, in fact, Larry was going to, uh, he I, it was going to get a billboard sign made up that said, Jeff, Ron, Larry, and that other guy. <laughs> uh, and so, but yeah, but it was just great. And I hope someday, you know, knock on wood, that maybe we'll all get back together and I would think, do you a know, year of it. Yeah, if not a year, six months, and then put it on the shelf for a while and revisit it. I mean, I would think it's something, something you, could, could, you know, if people are still wanting to do stand up, it's something you could do, like you said, whenever you want it. Who put the idea for blue collar together? I mean, uh, there's some. It, there's some. There, it depends what's on the who you real ask. story. I, I'm the real story you. is this: uh, Jeff and I used to joke about that because we kind of pulled from the same audience, right. and we used to joke about that in the twilight of our careers, we would go out and be doing car shows. You know, I'd be at one end of the stage going, "Here's your sign." He'd be at the other end going, "You might be a redneck." And our manager kept kind of went, "Well, you know what? Let's see what happens. Let's put a tool to." And the Kings of Comedy had come out, mm -hmm. and he saw that. And so J.P. Williams, our manager, was actually the one who put the idea together of let's get four guys. And we, all, we both knew Ron. Uh, and actually, there's a little bit of trivia here that when Blue Collar first started out, it wasn't Larry. There was a guy named Craig Hawksley out of St. Louis. Uh, trivia, okay. And Craig is like the fifth Beatle. You know, he, <laughs> he made it through the first six months and then things didn't work out. So we brought in Larry. And that was the... That was the key? That I mean, was the key. Because yeah. he, he was the cartoon. Mm -hmm. You know, he was what made it, he, he took it over the top. Of the four of you, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think objectively. I mean, I think, I think Jeff has a great shtick with, with Red mm -hmm. Meg. Um, Ron, uh, um, Larry is, you're right, the caricature and everything. Larry is, I always called Larry's the redneck Shecky Green. He's yeah, just yeah. one-liners. One-liners, yeah. one-liners, and, and, and well constructed oh, yeah. one-liners. I, I mean, we had Larry on the show a couple of years ago, and we got into the anatomy of a joke with him. And it was really interesting, because here's this guy who, who to most people, is a caricature, and he's got a brilliant comedy mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. But of the four of you, I think Ron's a fun, I mean, Ron. Can I tell you that, that Ron, for me, pound for pound's the funniest guy. Excuse me. Uh, he, Ron is one of the best storytellers. I was going to say, of, of the four of you, he's the one who isn't, you know, with the joke. He's, he tells stories. Ron could make you laugh, could tell you a story about walking through that curtain. Mm -hmm. And you'd sit here. And, I've watched Ron since he was an open micer uh, and just makes me howl. When he's on his game, there's nobody better. When he's off his game, he's still funny. He's still funny. He's still funny. All right, so we, we have already established that maybe another two or three years of the Bill Engball show, you know, keep your fingers mm -hmm. crossed. And, and, and then what, cut it back just to doing stand-up, or would there be other TV uh, yeah, projects, I'd cut it projects? back. I'd love to do it. <laughs> if we're talking about what my dream stuff is. Uh, well, you dreamed 28 years ago when yeah. you were working with Piscopo I'd love to and do Murphy. A, I'd love to do a movie. Western like Silverado. Really? So it's got some drama and some funny in it. Uh, and like I said, the TV show to go two or three years, that would be it. And then, you know, then I tell you, I, it would be beyond me to think what I could, what else I could want. Mm -hmm. Something would come along. Unless, unless they do Planet of the Apes Seven, and I, would <laughs> <like>. <laughs> I hear them uh, filing into the, to the Hilton Theater right now for your show. And I just, what, that yeah, was one of the great things I got to do with my. Yeah. Uh, well, you were talking about the, and then we'll say bye on this. But I got to meet Charlton Heston, which was Powering literally figure. there. Has, there's been no one in my career that. I've met that you just went, and we were doing the NRA convention. Oh God! And he was stepping down, and uh, I was coming up stage, and they had him walking, and they said, "Mr. Heston, this is Bill Engvall," and he should. And at this, he was still. This was in the last days, not I mean, the last months of right. his life. Still, shook my hand, looked me in the eye, and he goes, "Well, go knock him out, boy." He had that voice. Oh just my his God! Presence. And I was. You know, and of course, then the stupid thing is, I, of course, as I'm walking off, I want to say, take your hands off me, you <laughs> dirty, stinking apes. <laughs> but I thought, I better not have Charlton Heston. Yeah, really, it, and he's probably it, never heard that. Uh, never. I probably, it would have been the first time you should have done it. Hey, Bill, I want to thank this you. This is awesome. I can do this for hours, man. You're great. You're ne great. Next time you come back, we'll, we'll do take two. Done. I, I like to do fun stuff like that. 
And, and here's what's weird. When I turned 50, I thought it was going to be this awful day. But it was actually really cool because when I turned 50, all of a sudden the thought hit me, 50's good, but I can't wait till I'm 80. Because think about it. At 50, you kind of still care what people think about you. At 80, you got license to be a jackass. <laughs> oh, my God. That is going to be so awesome. Think about it. How many 80-year-old people do you know with tact? None of them. Because they don't have to. Does grandma hold her farts in at the dinner table? No. <laughs> she doesn't have to. She's 80. <laughs> She's earned the right to fart at the dinner table. Oh, I can't wait for that. You get pulled over by the cops. Do you know why I pulled you over? Because you're a jackass. <laughs> what? Take me to jail. I'll be dead by the time the paperwork's done. 